Can I please give a warm welcome to today's speaker, a designer and gardener, Leonie Cornelius. <laughs> Hi, all. You're very welcome um, to my talk on Dream Gardens. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. Um, it's a really, a real honor. Um, I have to admit, I've never actually given this talk to a group of people that may or may not have an interest in gardens. So it's always been like garden festivals and you know, kind of garden design courses and things like that. So um, over the past week or so, I've been kind of going, oh my God, how am I gonna make these guys not fall asleep? Um, and how do, how do I make it relevant to act what you guys actually do? Um, and it actually got me thinking about the overlap um, and the core of what we do as designers, as people that offer a service. Um, and um, really what, kind of, I, what it kind of boiled down to for me was that we offer an experience and we provide an experience. And um, that's something that's really important to me because I'm really interested in, in people and in how people experience a space, a garden, um, how they walk into it and, and feel like from an emotional point of view. Um, and I think that's, that has a lot of kind of overlap with what you guys do because what you're providing is an online, a virtual experience. And um, the overlap there is that if it doesn't feel good and if it doesn't feel right, the user is gone immediately. So same thing in a garden. If it's a badly designed space um, and it's not natural to move through and feels good, the user's never going to actually go out into their space. You know, you can't move around a space if it doesn't circulate well, etc. So there's a lot of kind of similarities and core um, principles that overlap. So within the virtual experience and the tangible, the garden, we have a lot of overlaps like making a space or an experience, the experience more usable, uh, more inspiring, more accessible, more forward thinking, probably more so for you guys than uh, in my role as a garden designer. But having said that, there's so much you can do to think ahead, um, even in garden design, sustainability, etc. cetera. Um, more beautiful and um, obviously more joyful. And by that, I mean that you either go, you go onto a web page and it feels good or you go into a garden and it feels good. And there's a huge amount of that in the book um, in how you experience a space and how it makes you feel. And that's always something I've been interested in because my mom is a psychotherapist. Um, so we've always kind of talked things to absolute death. Um, and it kind of bled into my work as well. Um, so the talk in a way, I mean, there's plenty of garden stuff there and most of it is gardens, but it's not just about gardens. It's about, um, it's about people and about experiences and about emotional reactions to spaces. Um, so for today's garden design talk, um, the talk is about you because you guys are actually the clients in this situation. So I want you to think, right, I want to design something in this and come away with something that can actually be used in your own spaces. So whether you have a balcony or um, a little patio or a huge field or some, a friend's um, space that you want to think about, it's worth kind of thinking about that as we go along and maybe just having something to take away from it that really inspires you. So um, the most important thing I think is when I go into somebody's space is who is that person? So I kind of try and leave my ego at the door when I go into somebody's space and it's all about that person. So in this instance, it's about you and you need to think about who am I? Um, you know, if you're thinking about designing a garden outdoor space for yourselves, uh, how do I live? How do I spend my day in the garden? And that's often, it, it's thought about, but it's not given enough attention. Um, so what you're thinking about is what do you like? What's your lifestyle? How do you spend time in the garden? Um, you know, who, who are you on a, on a personal level? Do you have kids, pets? Um, do you read, write sports? So they're all incredibly important elements to consider when you go about designing any kind of a space because that's kind of who you are from a lifestyle perspective. But when I started writing my book, um, I kind of realized that a lot of garden design books go straight into that. And yes, that's really important, but there's something else which is really important um, and which often does get completely forgotten about and that's your dreams for the space. And a few people were like, well, your dreams, you know, why, why do you have to dream and all that? You can just say, I want that nice garden. And again, probably because my mom's a psychotherapist, I like to take that step back and just think, no, it's good to dream and it's good to 
um, open your mind before you start going into detail and into functions and clotheslines and compost bins and all of that stuff which has nothing to do with dreams, it's just practical and function. So in this instance your dreams are your, your vision of your perfect space. So gardens are intensely personal, um, just like interior design is. They're part of you, part of your home, in the, in the best scenario. They're extensions of your living space. And that's why I think it's really important to kind of go into that in a little bit of detail um, before you start looking at practicalities and functions and um, things like that. So they're different from your functional requirements um, because they're personal and they're made up of memories of, you know, times you spent in gardens where you felt amazing um, or just, you know, say your grandmother's garden where you have a memory, a personal connection to, to the past or to, to people. Um, so there's a lot more to it. Um, than just dreaming up a, a nice little space. But one massive thing, even if you have a balcony, even if you have a very small patio, one thing I always say is at this stage, dream big. Um, and I know you're not gonna have the Taj Mahal on your balcony or you know, in a small patio space, but you can take elements of your, the biggest dream that you can possibly have and condense those elements down. And there is an exercise in my book um, which is called a dream uh, gardens diagram, which is just based around identifying what it is you love about that. So if you were looking at that and you know that was the space that you choose for the exercise, then you can zoom in on certain areas and say, well, I love the symmetry. I love the detail of the filigree, filigree work. I love the planting. I love the water, the reflections, the cam, whatever it is, you can pull all those together and they can become your concept. Um, so at this stage, there are no limits and again like every time I go into somebody's space they start going okay and now I need the patio and now I need that and you know I need a circulation route to here and I always have to stop people and go no just go back to you know be completely mad for a while before you start getting practical so there, there is no uh, you know there are no limits at this stage just um, dreaming up you know your perfect space um, I never know why I include this one, but for some reason it always makes me zoom out a bit in my own head. So I've left it in just for the sake of kind of underlining that idea of zooming out and not getting into the nitty gritty of, um, of detail at this point. So the exercise that I have in the book um, is really based on just a memory of a place where you were really, really happy. So thinking of, of a garden that, that you've visited or a memory that you have of having been in a garden. And it doesn't even need to be, you know, perfectly designed. It can be completely wild meadowscape or anything like that. Um, and um, you, basically what you're doing is you're thinking about what made that space feel so good to you. Why was it, why did you have a personal connection to it? Um, you know, was it the fun? Was it the symmetries, the wildness, the drama? So each space, and that's something you guys can do later on if you want, or take the books home, and it's, it's all kind of outlined in that too. And it's a really good, it sounds like a, a very simple exercise, but it's a really good way of allowing yourself to not design before you design. So just going, oh, I love that space. I, I really enjoyed that space. So this is my one. Um, unless somebody else wants to give me one. <laughs> it's, um, I love the Alhambra in uh, the south of Spain, which is an amazing, absolutely amazing garden um, and palace. And they're Moorish gardens, they're really symmetrical, but yet the planting is really wild and, and free. So I love that combination of that, those kind of that perfect architecture and then the wild planting. So for me, it was you know the timeless feel of it, the balance, the water, the wild planting, the harmony. And this is the exercise. What you're doing is a simple sketch a, a spider diagram and you're putting the characteristics of the space above and the moods below. So the moods of this space actually become your concept of your garden design. So you need to think, right, that's what I want to bring to my own space. And even if it is a balcony, you know, there's balance, there's calm, you want to feel at ease, you want to feel happier, you want to feel freer. If say you went for a meadow that you felt incredibly happy in and a memory that you have, there's so many ways of bringing elements of a meadow, the movement of the grasses, uh, looking at the wide open sky. Why not try and create something that kind of emulates that feel, even if it is a tiny balcony or um, a small patio. So really that's just about taking those and bringing them into your concept. So for me, it was the Alhambra, um, creating a calm space inspired by, um, by a Moorish palace, 
yet the planting is wild, so there's not too much perfection going on, which you know can become boring and you're never going to actually be able to achieve and maintain anyway. Um, so that's your newfound concept. So that was my um, scenario there, a cam space inspired by the Alhambra Gardens in Spain with wild natural planting, plenty of water and a timeless feel. So really simple, but there's so many elements then that you can choose, pick out and build into your design. So that informs your materials, your colors, your water features. It's easy then, because I think a lot of people don't know where to start. So this is a great way of kind of identifying a concept and then going, right, the, the paving I need to get needs to match that feel and the water needs to match that and everything needs to follow that feel and underline that. And then a concept and a garden works naturally and it's not disjointed. So the next part is um, form follows function, which, was, uh, which Louis Sullivan said. And um, as you guys know, if uh, you know, when, within the, the, uh, the internet, you go into a page, it doesn't work, you're gone immediately. So the same thing applies to a badly designed garden. If it's badly designed, if it doesn't work, never mind the look or the, you know, the beauty or whatever, it can be beautiful, but if it doesn't work, it's annoying and you're, you just don't want to be in this space. So basically our gardens from a tangible perspective are, are there spaces for living and they need to work. It's really simple. And uh, the first thing I get my clients to do is do out a list. And sorry, the second thing, after dreaming, <laughs> get them to do a list of how they spend their day in the garden. So basically how they, the, the most boring stuff, I hang my washing out, you know, the dog goes around, the kids go to the trampoline, all of those kind of things. Um, but also to, to say, I like to entertain, so it'd be nice to have a pool to dangle our legs in, etc. That's also the Bloom Garden this year, dangling our legs, so I had to include that. Um, so that's just really an idea of what your day looks like in the garden and all the things the garden needs to, to um, function for you like. So the functions of the garden. And um, then the list of functional requirements, that's it. Basically, really simple, really easy. List out everything you need in the actual garden. And it doesn't need to be um, super detailed, but you need this because the next step is putting it onto paper. And when you put it onto paper, you need to tick off each and every single one of those. And if one of them is missing, then the garden's not going to work 100%. So <laughs> that was a client of mine in Strand Hill in Sligo. Um, the job was kind of half done. The builder's still on site. The dog, which they weren't supposed to have a dog. The whole garden was based around them not having kids or a dog. They now have a child and a dog. <laughs> um, and he destroyed the garden. But this was before we did the garden. Um, and you can see it's, there's nothing there and it's, it looks horrendous. The house is getting there, everything is brilliant. But a lot of spaces that you see, um, you have to assess really, really well in order to get the, the design right. So you're looking at everything from soil samples, aspect, garden climate, probably pretty boring at this stage, but it's so important. So even if you have like a small balcony, um, you need to make sure that you address things like wind, privacy, views, um, you know, to, to make sure you don't make any mistakes and then end up with, you know, the neighbour right there looking in at you even though you wanted this enclosed private um, haven. So they're all things you need to list out at the very start. Obviously, for bigger sites it gets a lot more complicated and you need to put in more detail. Sometimes we get surveyors in because it's too detailed to do with slopes and all that kind of stuff. But for small spaces it's, it's relatively easy to do. The, mo the main thing common sense, you know, you're looking at views, um, does it have light? So you're looking at the strengths of the space um, and how can you enhance them? That's really important. And then you're also looking at the challenges. So you can see the, the two there. Um, all the garden, we do a, a show called RTE Super Garden and pretty much all the gardens we go into um, look like that, you know, absolute disasters. And, you know, after the show leaves then they're, ta-da! <laughs> yeah, right. Five weeks later, blood, sweat and tears. But um, yeah, I, you know, that's actually the joy of it anyway. It's television and transformation and we all love that. Um, but as I say, nothing is unsolvable. Um, and the main thing is having that vision and the dream for what is to come. And I think some people find that easier than others um, to imagine. Like my mom cannot imagine what a garden will look like. She's like, how can you even visualize how, you know, how, how it will be? Um, 
probably yeah, probably because I studied it. But you know, it's um, so yeah. It's all about building on strengths and overcoming challenges um, in gar in gardens and garden design. Um, site measurements. I touched on that briefly just there. It can be incredibly complicated, and it can be very very simple. To just doing a, a scale sketch, putting in your sizes, your heights, and where the entrance exit, uh, where the the pathways are. And then the first thing is getting the site right, doing a very simple scale sketch and exploring what, what's happening on the site. So I'm not going to go into big detail because that is actually boring. Um, but y it's good to know, and it's detailed in the book as well, just to know that that's how you have to start if you want to take on a plot of any considerable size. Um, which actually, it's, you know, that's kind of a realistic, large city garden. Um, that you could kind of measure out yourself as opposed to getting somebody in to do it for you. Um, so after that comes the functional layout plan, which is basically taking the functions, so what the garden has to do for you, and plonking them on the plan. Um, and they're bubbles. They're not designed. They're not beautiful. They're not details. They're basically sketched bubbles telling you exactly what happens on site. So where you need privacy, where you want a patio, where you want um, screening, where you need a windscreen. So all the things that you looked at that were challenges need to be addressed on this in a bubble. So it doesn't need to represent the shape or anything. So it's actually really easy to do. Um, and it, but it's so informative to when you start going to sketch detail and you start putting in um, details in, the, in it. So that um, brings me to the bigger picture, great design, quite far away from the, the bubbles. Um, this is one of my favorite pictures. Um, it's Tom Stewart Smith. He's a UK based designer. And um, it's just such a beautiful picture because it shows how a garden can blend into the landscape beyond. Without, it just feels like it's a part of the landscape. Um, and I'll go back to that um, in a minute. So what makes good design? Um, and are we born designers? It's an, it's an interesting question because I don't think we're necessarily born designers. Some people are better at it than others, um, but it's definitely something you can learn. Um, what does help, and I'm sure a lot of you guys are design-based or de from design backgrounds, um, so you'd be aware of a lot of these principles um, and the fact that they do kind of influence everything from car design to pen design to, you know, everything has those principles. And again, it goes back to what what works and functions. It goes back to the principles of um, these four and then another one I'll talk about after. The first one we'll look at briefly is uh, the unity and harmony and we'll talk about it just in the garden setting um, and how it works with the house, the garden and the setting. And that's the picture I showed you before. This is the same one in winter at the bottom. Um, again, Tom Stewart Smith in the top one too. Um, and it just shows how um, how the house, first of all, is linked with the garden. You can see the colours, the textures pick up on the red brick, the grasses, and the water in the sizes. So you've got a connection between the house and the garden, the design space. And then beyond that, you have a connection of the design garden with the landscape beyond. So in the landscape beyond, for example, you've got darker spots of the big trees. And Tom's brought that into the foreground of, um, of the garden by having darker shapes, the topiary shapes in the front. And then the lighter ponds, which are kind of echo what's going on behind. So that creates unity and harmony because you're blending all of that together. Um, simplicity. I mean, the Persian gardens are a huge um, influence for me and I think are a great example of simplicity. Uh, less is more. And I think that really applies to um, you know, online as well. There's so much being chucked at you all the time um, that it's really nice to have a calm, simple design sometimes. You know, there's nothing more I like more than looking at a website that's just like, ah, oh, calm, not too many ads, not too many things being thrown at you, you know. Um, but of course there has to be a balance. <laughs> Which brings me to, no! It's, it should bring me to balance, really, shouldn't it? <laughs> Scale and proportion. Um, so really, same thing as uh, the links between the house and the setting and the views beyond uh, and the garden. It's the relationship between the house. So you don't want the house to be absolutely gigantic and person to feel really small. Same thing, the planting. So the trees can't be tiny and the house really big or vice versa. So there's got to be a relationship between everything that's happening in the space, the landscape beyond, and then also obviously the house and the person because we can't forget that it's you that's experiencing that space. 
And the best way of doing that is to start sketching or, or thinking in 3D as opposed to 2D flat way. There's Alice. And there's balance. <laughs> um, so balance is really all about everything coming together in a pleasing composition. Um, and there's so much that, that, work, that, that comes into that from all the other uh, things we looked at, scale and proportion. Um, it's, it's actually really easy to get balance right when you have a symmetrical garden. So the likes of the, the Alhambra, if you take that as inspiration, it's quite easy to get it right because you've got that inherent uh, symmetry whilst if you kind of push it to being asymmetrical, the, the design, it does get a little bit harder because you need to make sure you get the balance of the, the forms, the shapes, the sizes, and all of that right. So it does get a little bit trickier. You'll also have mystery, excitement, light and darkness, uh, balance and color, um, and, and structures also need to be balanced. So there are great ways, I think, to start um, looking at design. I don't know how, what percentage of you guys are design-based um, or have a background in design, so I should have probably asked that at the start. <laughs> I'm sure you're aware of, of some of these or most of these. Um, and, but they're, they're a great thing to even, even if you do know and you're aware of them, to make sure you remind yourself of on a kind of regular basis. The other thing that, um, that I always find fascinating to look at is the golden ratio. And again, you're probably all aware of it, um, but I find it quite interesting in garden design because you're looking um, at nature to inform nature. So, you know, from, from ferns and the way they grow to, um, you know, succulents. There was actually a garden at Chelsea which was based all around the mathematics of geometry, um, which had the su succulent on the right there, had a lot of those kind of shapes and forms. And the mathematics behind it are just, like, I, I, I don't do maths. To me, it's absolutely baffling, but it's incredible. It's really inspiring to look at and to apply to projects. Um, and the fact that um, it's also found in our bodies and the fact that it, you know, repeats and it's just, it's incredible. It's, it's, I find it really, really interesting that when you clench your fist, it forms into a perfect uh, golden ratio curl. But that can inform, that does and can inform um, a huge amount of design. And I very cheekily stuck it on top of Google, so I don't know if that actually does, but it kind of works. <laughs> but it works in garden design, the Apple logo, so that, and car design and everything, it, it kind of influences everything. And the reason for that is really because we're using what is inherently found in nature, and that's informing design. So it's kind of, it, it's an interesting cycle. So the next thing is, um, choosing shapes for the garden. So we're, we've gone and looked at the functions of the garden and putting that in in bubbles um, and how it works in how we make sure everything is included that you want and need in a garden. And the next bit is um, how to actually put that into a plan that you can work from. And um, personally, I, I go through the same thing and I recognized this a couple of years ago and I went, oh, okay, that's what's happening. I go through the same kind of um, problem every time I have a design job. I start off going, this is going to be amazing. It's going to be such a good project. And then I start sketching and I start doing stuff. And I'm like, oh my god, it's going to be a disaster. It's going to be horrendous. The client's going to hate it. And then I start doing more on it and force myself through that. And I come out the other end and go, OK, it's going to be fine. It, it'll be great. It'll be good. <laughs> so I think a huge amount of people go through that. And I think designers in general always go through that kind of stage of self-doubt. And the hardest part is actually this, which is, for me personally is putting the shapes and making decisions as opposed to just messing and playing. So um, I was happy when I learned that it is actually very easy to do, that basically you take the, the functional layout plan with the bubbles and you sketch over that with, um, with a, either a layout paper or a tracing paper and you just explore the shapes based on what you have from those bubbles because you know you want the patio at the back door because that's where you want to go from the kitchen where the door is. So you know you want it there. You just need to decide on shapes. You need to decide how they link to each other. So you've already made a lot of decisions without knowing it. You've placed the patio where it wants to go. You've put the, um, the, the trampoline where you can see the kids from the kitchen. You know, you've done all of that background work without realizing. So you just explore. And you start looking at shapes and what works. Um, you can have, I can see the squares, free form, circles, combination. Um, you, can, you can have completely free form shapes. 
it's really what appeals to you and mostly actually what your concept wants. So if you have a very um, loose meadow style garden and you want it to be, feel really wild, then unless you're doing it on purpose, you're not going to introduce you know, large concrete slabs, which I actually love the idea of, but you know, you, then you'd be breaking those rules for a reason if that's what you wanted to do. Um, so it depends on, on what the concept is to make it work for you. And then after that, if you've chosen your shapes, you've decided where everything goes, comes the really, really exciting part because you've got your concept. You know how it's supposed to feel. Um, and you get to play around basically with um, materials, colors, planting. Um, and it just all follows your concept. So in my case, if it's the Alhambra, um, God, I'd love an Alhambra garden actually, now that I think about it. Don't Google my garden, <laughs> whatever you do. <laughs> I don't know if technology is that advanced yet to zoom in right down, is it? Uh, mm -mm. <laughs> it's in a mess. <laughs> um, but basically, it all comes down to your concept and how to um, make, bring that concept to life through materials, colors, and planting. Is it really? Like, like can you actually see different plants? <laughs> no, 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 it's okay. <laughs> Not much to see. I've had a very busy year. That's crazy. I digress. Um, so the concept, um, again, that goes back to the idea of kind of fleshing out the whole design to suit your feel and to suit what, you've, what your dream is, you know. So um, if it was a, a seaside garden, um, you know, what do you bring into it? Do you bring in pebbles? And then also think, and I go into this in the book, don't be afraid to go for all the materials that are expected and then take some out and break the rules. And if it was a seaside garden, it's pebbles and ropes and all that, you know, get rid of the ropes and replace it with rusted metal or get rid of, you know, the, the expected pebble and replace it with concrete or do something that makes it new and fresh and not the, you know, the expected. Um, I don't think I say it there, but that's, that's outlined in the book and it's actually a big part of I think what makes really good garden design is breaking the rules once you know them, once you know what you want to achieve. Um, so being selective, if you're gonna go for colors uh, and materials, choose two colors, two strong colors and two strong materials. Don't go mad um, because you want the concept to be really, really strong. And you can always add little bits here and there. You can always create little rooms that have separate fields, but you can see it in this you know, the, the strength of that rusted core 10 steel and then picking up on that tiny little planting bits in that same color um, just balances so well. Um, this one again, you can see the designer Luciana Gubelai has chosen loads of new, kind of neutral muted tones. They're different colors, but loads of um, different materials, but they all work because they're all neutrals. So again, the palette is really simple, really clean. Same designer, um, again, he loves neutrals, um, but it really allows structure and form to jump out at you. Whilst if there was too many colors there, you wouldn't see those ball shapes, you wouldn't see the, the, the multi-stem trees. And then this one, Luis Barragan, he's um, a Mexican architect. Um, so he, he chose loads of different colors for the space, but he used one material. So the colors are, there's plenty of color, the, the color of the sky and the, the water, and um, loads of colors, but the same material pretty much throughout. And then the last slide is really to show that, you know, vegetable growing can actually be pretty too. It doesn't have to be a kind of ugly, um, you know, plot. You can actually use cool materials like the wicker and the timber and the terracotta and make it really colorful and, and pretty. Um, so the last bit I'll go into is the planting perfection, uh, the choosing planting. So again, the planting that you choose needs to follow your concept. So um, if your concept is, you know, you want a jungle haven in, in Ranala, um, you need to make sure all the plants you choose are not only work for Ireland, work for the space, but that they also work for, um, for the, the concept. And uh, so you study what works, what, how the jungle looks, you know, big leaves, the foliage, the bamboo, um, and how to make that work. In, and it's, it's totally workable. I just wrote an article about that, actually. Um, and it can work really, really well and look really lush and jungle-like. Um, and again, for the planting, we're also considering the, the principles of design, which are really important. 
So one more thing is right plant, right place. Um, and it's really about uh, a huge amount of interest these days has been put into creating um, sustainable uh, gardens that grow themselves as opposed to having to maintain all the time. And it's really, it's really opened up a lot of new um, kind of avenues for, for young designers in the, like Chelsea and Bloom and all those places um, where you're not stuck in kind of old traditions, which don't work really, um, unless you have huge amounts of time. So that's what we're talking about here is um, the idea of having organic ecosystems that just grow and that you can let die down in winter and they'll come back up. And there's that, that cycle, that natural cycle. And yet feel like they've been there forever. I mean, that bottom one is a, is a Chelsea garden. You, you know, you never think it looks like it's in the, in the middle of the Provence. Um, so there's a few different planting styles and I'll just go through them really quickly because they're all in the book. Um, and there's so many of them in the book and I've pulled out like four or five of them. Um, and basically the cottage style planting, which is that real old English um, formal style and looks like it's kind of been scattered there, but it's actually pretty high maintenance because you've got kind of the box balls and, you know, all of the, the, the perennials dying down and the bulbs that have to be taken up and all of that kind of stuff. Um, modernist style planting, which is very clean, very modern. A lot of that gets combined with kind of naturalistic kind of wild meadow planting, which works really well. You can see the top one there is a Chelsea garden and they've kind of done that. Um, that's the naturalistic planting, which really echoes what's happening in nature. And the idea of naturalistic planting is that it, it does just scatter and grow and evolve into something fresh and new. And that has really been a focus on planting styles in the past 10 years or so, that it's gone away from that uber um, planned and maintained idea to a more kind of letting nature do what it wants to do and embracing that. So that brings me back to the core of what we do. And um, just if there's anything that I'd love you guys to go away with today after the talk is um, that connection between, first of all, everything that we do as people, um, whether it's a garden design or an online platform or, um, or any other creative or design based um, uh, endeavor, that there is always that connection. And the connection is the person and the experience. And, um, much like garden design, it, everything is personal. Um, and to keep that connection in mind. Thank you. <laughs> I was dreading that. I'm good now. <laughs> that, that was great. So that was really, I'll let, I'll let Thank you, you go in here into the middle. Um, that was great. Really, really entertaining and really informative. Um, so we're going to open up to audience questions in a minute. I'm just going to ask maybe the, the first question. Mm -hmm. So the reality for some people, me, is that I, I love the idea of having a beautiful garden or like we, we talked about my, my little mm -hmm. patio, mm -hmm. but I do struggle to keep the odd potted plant alive. <laughs> okay. Um, is this book beyond me? Is there a baby, is there a baby step, a pre-book? <laughs> oh God, no. I do? <laughs> well, that goes back to the right plant, right place. Yeah. You know, and finding out what plants really need, I guess. So um, identifying what the plant that you choose, what, that, what the needs are, what the yeah. soil needs are, what the moisture levels are, making sure there's enough drainage, making sure there's not, you know, that mm -hmm. it doesn't dry out. Mm -hmm. So if you do have, say, a pot, you can control that, so that's easy. You just yeah. need to inform yourself. Okay. So use Google and find out exactly what the plant needs. <laughs> um, I actually use it on a daily basis for all sorts of stuff, from Great. cooking to God knows what. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, to, to inform yourself of what that plant needs mm -hmm. or to go, right, I have, don't have huge amounts of rainfall in that particular area in the garden where I have the pots, and to go, right, I'm gonna use drought-friendly plants and then find out what you could plant there mm -hmm. and then create a scheme around that. So okay. a, a dry, you know, kind of desert feel mm -hmm. space okay. with grasses or something like okay. that. So it goes back to what you said a while ago about just the, the knowledge. Yeah, base and yeah. And for me, baby steps, yeah. little, little, little baby <laughs> steps. Um, I'm going to ask one more question, then I go to the audience. Um, if, if a community, like just say a group of people who live in a housing estate, decided to have a, to create a small community garden or, or mm -hmm. allotment. Um, you, would you have any advice on what they could do to make that a, a success? Ooh, um, planning, planning, definitely huge thing. Make sure that you know exactly what you're doing. 
um, look at who's going to be using it. So going back to the user, is it going to be um, you know the younger people in the community? Will they be involved? Um, is it going to be the older people? So you might raise beds. Yeah. Um, so finding finding out the user is probably the main thing. Mm -hmm. um, identifying who will be using it, um, and then making it fun, mm -hmm. making sure that like the kids get involved and you know everybody wants to be there. So maybe have some sort of a social space or something mm -hmm. in it, like a small gazebo or a little polytunnel where everyone can hang out, and mm -hmm. because then you'll want to be there and you'll want to put work in. And okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah, it's lovely. It's great. Have we got any um, questions from the audience? No, we do. Got one here. Um, Wilfred, can you bring this? Yeah, my first one. Probably yeah. get asked. Oh, sorry. Oh. Probably get asked this one all the time. Is that on? I can hear you. Yeah. Great. Um, uh, what's your take on uh, synthetic grass? Because it's sort of. When you're doing a lot of other stuff, it seems like uh, it's a, an easy option, but is it the right option? Um, it's funny because a lot of garden designers, we, ha we had a big discussion about this during Super Garden, and 90% of the people that we were talking to at the time were like, oh, it's horrible, it's horrible. But there's an absolute place for it. Um, like Today FM have it on their, their roof garden, and they were ashamed of it. And I was like, no, but why would you put real grass there? It would be you know, head wrecking. So I think it depends on your needs, on your needs, on what you need it for. And if you think it'll make your life easier um, and better, and you can work it into the design in such a way that it looks good, then absolutely, why not? You know, I wouldn't be a snob about it. <laughs> I think a lot of people do, and they almost do it to pretend, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Great. Cool. Got um, one in the uh, second row here. We just have to check that the microphone's working before we get it, get it to you. You can shout, that's fine. We <laughs> just want to make sure that we hear you on the recording. <laughs> Thank you. Totally natural. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh, it's working. Perfect. Um, thank you so much for the talk. It looks absolutely amazing and makes me wish to just drop my job and start gardening all week. <laughs> <laughs> you come work for me. Yes. <laughs> Hire me. Um, what can we do? Like most of us, we can't probably afford at this stage a garden in Dublin, um, let, let alone like anything in Dublin. Um, <laughs> what, what can we do to create a nice space on our balconies? Or if we don't even have a balcony, maybe inside like a small oasis to relax and enjoy what we saw in the slides? Um, well, first thing is I'm, I'm concerned with that quite a lot because I hate the idea of design being exclusive and the idea that only those that have like 100,000 euro to spend on a design can afford it. And the first garden I did, actually I don't think there's any pictures of it in this, um, at Bloom was made with scaffold, old scaffolding planks. And so if you want to create something um, really special without putting huge amounts of money into it, you have to kind of rethink the materials you're using. Um, you have to rethink the amount of time you want to put into it. So those scaffolding planks, they looked absolutely stunning when we were done with them but we sanded and sanded and sanded and sanded and to get them to look really well and then you know stain them again and again and again so reimagining old materials is great but then everybody's kind of started catching on to that too so like scaffolding planks are hard to get you know what you call them uh, pallets and you know um, but be creative you know put, get get hands on yourself and it doesn't need to cost a huge amount of money um, it's hard to be specific because I don't know exactly what you're talking about but um, say if you were, you know, instead of, if you wanted something on a, on a uh, windowsill inside, instead of just getting a plastic window box, create something, you know, even if it's made with driftwood or made with timber that you, you stain up to suit the color scheme inside, um, or uh, go to Pinterest and, you know, research certain things. And, you know, you, there's so many ideas you can kind of bring in to the home by just getting creative yourself. I know that's a really bad answer, but. <laughs> so it's about um, making it, it's creativity, a real project. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So not, not just yeah. a, a quick fix, which is what I kind of tend to do. By yeah. buying a, a but that, in that way, you can work design principles into it, and then you'll create something beautiful, as opposed to just you know, placing something that somebody else mightn't have put a huge amount of thought into. So it's the thought process, and then making it personal to you. Because you know? if you make it yourself or have it made, um, even if it is like, say, a, a gate, a rusted steel gate, it might be old materials, but you thought it up, so you know it's going to be perfect for you. Okay, lovely. Any more audience questions? Um, so I'm moving into a new house. We just bought a new house um, in 
just down the road. Um, and we've got a relatively basic square garden, nothing spectacular right now, it's rubble. Um, myself and my wife were talking about what we do from the start, right? So for example, obviously we'll be busy inside the house, but do you have any advice in terms of if we wanted to put down let's say trees first we start from big and work our way down or do we start with like you know little potted plants and work our way up have you kind of come across that before where would you start oh loads um and the the main thing i think is before you start planting before you start doing anything is dreaming that that kind of figuring out what you want from the garden before you start placing things and um even before you start going into the you know the privacy and all of those kind of things so making sure that your dream for the house which you probably already have and you have you know materials and features in there that you want to pick up on and the style of the house try and bleed that out so pick up on colors materials on the floor like if you have say concrete floors bleed it out or if there's tiles or timber you know try and continue that because then it'll become an extension of your living space but making sure you identify what kind of feel you want what kind of style you want um, and then bleeding that in through the whole space you know and connecting them and then you can you can always start by planting a few trees if you want it to now and then work the rest around that but just make sure that you don't end up putting them somewhere where you don't want them so making sure you follow the the process in your head a little bit of where do i need privacy um where do i need um windscreen so do analyze the site a bit before you look at trees or that sort of thing okay we probably have time for one more question uh, any final audience questions no yeah oh yeah Two, two more actually, we'll fit them, we'll fit them both in. It's a very practical question. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, like, is there any place that you would recommend us to go to if we want to design, for example, our little balcony or so? Um, like a garden center we can go to that you could really recommend? Because as mm. far, I, I looked for plants and I finally went to Ikea and they were all <laughs> sold out. So um, that wasn't really a success. So maybe there is a better place to go to that's also affordable, you know? You're talking about outdoor plants or? Yeah, outdoor, yeah. just as in indoor, I don't know, maybe. Yeah, I, I mean, there's loads of places in or around Dublin. There's um, a place called Garden World. I don't know if you've come across Garden World in, in Kilquaid. Um, no, Kilcoo, Kilquaid can't remember I think it's yeah in Wicklow and <laughs> um, they're fantastic they have incredible plants uh, good quality plants too I generally deal more with the wholesale um, end of things so larger plants you know um, but they're they're fantastic um, and they have a huge selection and they're very knowledgeable so they'll actually help talk you through whatever you need or um, materials wise I love salvage yards so if you have you know ideas for a balcony or something like that to go to old architectural salvage and just choose out interesting cool you know even one thing and then build around if you don't have a, a specific idea in mind a place more in the city center ish would be plant life <coughs> on cork street oh, yeah. um yeah. closer by yeah. if you don't have a car yeah. Um, my question kind of comes back to what we discussed earlier, it's like uh, around style. <laughs> no, about style. Okay, like, okay. is is there a, like an Irish style that you've seen over the years, or how has that developed, or is there something that makes Irish gardens stand out from other, let's say, European gardens? Um, it's interesting because for a long time, Irish design would have been influenced hugely by the likes of Chelsea, the t the RHS shows, Tatton Park. Um, and all of the big shows, you know, garden shows, show garden shows in, in the UK. Um, I think since the, um, since, uh, since Bloom was launched, which is what, 11 years ago now? I think um, that kind of gave Irish designers a platform here um, to showcase. So I think there's been a huge shift in that. Um, and I think an Irish planting style and feel has developed, um, which is a little bit more relaxed and natural than say its English counterpart. Having said that, I mean, you know, trends kind of cross over and back and you've got trends coming from um, the south of France and there's like an overall trend of n naturalistic planting and sustainability and um, allowing gardens to just be the way they want to be. Um, which actually in last year, it came back a little bit to being more structured again. Um, so there are trends that go across all of them, but I do think Irish designers have developed 
their own styles. Um, and I think this year at Bloom, it was interesting to see there was a lot of interest at Chelsea and the Chelsea designers were tweeting a lot about designers here and about what gardens they liked and stuff, which was amazing, you know, to, to have that coming back um, to Ireland. It's great. Thank you. Thank you, Leonie, for your, for thank you. your time and thanks everyone for your questions. Thank you, guys. <laughs>